Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. When we're considering the category of relation as we find it in Chapter 7 of Aristotle's work, The Categories, there's two things that he talks about that we want to look at in a little bit more detail, particularly so that we can run through the examples that he's using. Um, let's remind ourselves, too, that when we're talking about relative terms, the things that are the pros T in this, this category of relation or the relative we're talking about terms that are understood in relation to another, in, in relation to something else, right? So they are either of another, like for example, the son is the son of the father or the mother. Likewise, the mother is the mother of the son. Or they're understood in relation to something else. And oftentimes these can be lexically, uh, you know, uh, synonymous. We can, we can turn them around so that we could say, you know, we have this, this essentially origin relation or belonging relation, or we can just talk about relation itself. Now, there's two things that Aristotle talks about as sometimes belonging to relative terms and sometimes not. And those are contraries, where terms are actually contrary to each other, or if you like, opposites is another way of putting it, or whether the terms admit of degrees. So um, let's look first at contrariness or contraries. The Greek word here is enantiotes, that's a substantive for enantia, those, those are the things, you know, uh, one thing is an enantion, and the other thing is another enantion, plural enantia. These are opposed to each other. And when we talk about contraries, usually what Aristotle has in mind, the examples that he, he typically brings up throughout the rest of this work, are things like black and white, uh, sweet, salty, or actually sweet to bitter um, when it comes to taste, um, you know, when it comes to notes, high and low, um, you know, uh, things along those lines, hot, cold, good, bad. Now, in this case, he's going to use um, virtue and vice, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So what we want to point out is that not every relative term, or really a pair of relative terms, correlatives, uh, admits of um, contrariness. They're not all opposites to each other. So for example, he likes to use this one quite a lot, double. Um, one thing is double of another, that doesn't mean that it's the thing's opposite, right? Uh, and you could say, well, what about half? Well, that's a correlative, but it's not an opposite in the way that Aristotle is talking about here. Likewise, triple, any other sort of multiple word like that, or, or a fraction word, is just not going to give us a relationship of contrariness. Now, we could contrast that to the one that he actually brings up. And this one is a bit tricky as an example, because he talks about virtue, or, um, you know, very broadly speaking, we could say goodness, right? Um, he says, uh, arete, you know, excellence, uh, moral goodness. And he says, this is contrary to vice, kakia, means badness, really, at the core of it. Um, and why is he bringing these up as relative terms? Especially since if you've read further on in the work, you know that he is going to talk about these sorts of things in terms of, um, 
a different type of category, that of uh, the one that's following, that of, uh, what do we call it, the poion, the quality, right? It's a, it's a particular kind of quality. Well, virtues and vices are what Aristotle in Greek calls hexes. We translate that as, as habits. Um, it's one of the Greek words that we use to, to translate habits. And so it means something that's really rooted in your, your character, in your typical response to things. You've developed it over time. But it's a virtue of something, right? The virtue is itself relative to something. So if, if we talk about, for one example, generosity, or as it's often translated, liberality, that's a virtue that bears upon um, how, you, how you spend money, how you, how you use your resources that you have in relation to other people and in relation to yourself, right? So it's a, you could say it's a virtue of spending and receiving wealth, as Aristotle does in fact say in the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, the vice would likewise be, let's say, let's say the vice is stinginess or miserliness or meanness, sometimes it's translated, right? That would also be a vice of some particular subject matter, which is how we use our wealth uh, in sp you know, spending and, and receiving, or as they say, in getting and giving, right? And so those are relatives. They're not actually relative to each other, they're opposites to each other. So this can be a little bit misleading, right? Because it's not that the virtue is the virtue of or it's relational to vice and vice is relational to virtue. These are opposites, but these themselves are in fact relative terms. So this is a good example of something that does in fact have a um, set of opposites or uh, contraries as relative terms. They're, they're opposites in one way, they're relative terms in another. Likewise, if we say knowledge and ignorance, and we say um, knowledge of, I've used the example of plumbing, so let's take carpentry as another example, because I'm a little bit tired of talking about plumbing all the time. So knowledge of carpentry, right? You actually understand how to um, put together, say something like a chalkboard, right? How to build this, this frame and then how to fit, this might be, there might be some other job, how to fit a slate piece inside of it. Um, now, you know, a lot of people know how to do that sort of thing. They have the knowledge of, so there's the relation there, how to build a chalkboard, carpentry, and other people have ignorance with respect to or in relation to carpentry building a chalkboard in this case, right? Those ignorance and knowledge would be opposites or uh, contraries to each other. So Aristotle uh, can use those sorts of examples as well. So what we see is there are some relations, some relative terms that do uh, encompass opposites or contraries. But it's not that the contraries themselves are in relation to each other. That's not where the relation part is. We might think about it as in two separate planes. It's a little bit different when we get to degrees. Now, when we talk in terms of degrees, that's actually sort of an English shorthand for the locution that Aristotle always uses for this sort of thing, which is a little bit closer to the subject. He talks about a more and a less, a malon and a hechon um, in, in his Greek, right? So why are we talking about degrees? Well, there's, there's the possibility of more, there's the possibility of less. So take you know, me for example, I'm a tall guy, you can tell by you know, when I go up to the chalkboard, right? Um, chalkboard is, I don't know, maybe six foot eight or something like that, I'm six foot three. If I shrink, you know, I get smaller and smaller, right? Uh, just imagine, imagine my bones shortening, right? <laughs> then um, there's a less to me, right? My height is, is becoming less uh, as measured against other objects. Or I could get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Um, and we can go on and on with, with these sorts of examples. So, so what about that? When it comes to a greater and a less, do relational terms admit of that? Aristotle says, look, some don't have degrees. And notice that he uses the same example, this double, right? 
Um, there's no such thing as more or less double of something. You could say you're closer to double, but you're not, you, you know, if you've got the word double on the table, look, it's, it's double, it's two times the thing, you don't get a more or a less. So this doesn't, doesn't actually work. There are some, what we would call, you know, in, in some respect, quantitative terms, although they could also be quite qualitative, where we can talk about a greater and a less in terms of relation. Notice that these terms are relative terms that we, we use to talk about how things are connected with each other. So like, homoion and unlike, anomoion, um, these are actually, to some degree, opposites, aren't they? Um, the way that they function here is that they indicate a more, or they admit of a more and a less. So we can say that two things are more similar to each other, more alike to each other, right? Pick another uh, guy uh, who's roughly in his 40s, uh, wearing a tie and a shirt, maybe a different color. You know, let's say he's a little bit shorter than me. Um, and it was, while we're imagining, let's say he's fatter than me too, right? Because why not if, if we can do that, right? And let's say he's balding and I've got hair. Well, we're still similar in many respects in that, you know, we're both, we're both men. We're both wearing this thing. Now imagine that we, you know, we, we've got identical ties and shirts and that suddenly he sprouts a whole head of hair. And it's even, you know, tied in back like this. And maybe he wears glasses too. Or maybe he doesn't wear glasses. Maybe we use the example that comes up as like a TV trope, right? Maybe I'm the evil twin because I, of course, have the goatee and, you know, the glasses. And so he's, he's the good guy, as we, you know, in the 80s shows, right? But we're still very, very similar to each other. And if we go further with this example, the more similar we are to each other, the better chance I'm going to have as an evil twin in bringing about my nefarious plans. Because I can get people to think that, hey, it's just, um, you know, uh, we'll call him Craig instead of Greg. Hey, it's just Craig, and he happened to have grown a goatee, right? Now, this one, of course, took a little while to grow, but imagine it's, you know, closer shaved the way it usually tends to be, right? So those admit of degrees. Gets a little tricky with the next example that Aristotle uses, equal and unequal. Here we have to think out a little bit. How is this supposed to work for Aristotle? Unequal, anison in Greek, well, that one makes perfect sense. We can say that two things are more or less uh, unequal to each other the further apart that they get, right? So, um, you know, again, remember, imagining this, this short, uh, uh, fatter, balding uh, version of myself that's, that's further away from me, not equal to me, or, you know, we could use that in other respects as well. Equal gets a little bit tricky because... Aristotle has already associated equality particularly with the category of quantity. So we have to think of equality here as in terms of a, a relative term. How would that actually function? And it's not entirely clear. So we have to imagine something like thinking that two things are very, very similar to each other. And that's perhaps what he means in this case by equal, even though it's translated as equal in, in, in this. It's not numerical equality, but, you know, uh, something similar to similarity, only very, very close proximity. So now you notice, this is very interesting, um, some relational terms admit of contraries, some don't. Some admit of degrees, and some don't. So you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis.